everything that's been going on this year, there has been a unique opportunity given to all of us to not only ask what have we been losing, but what does this make possible in this new moment? For my wife and I, one of the things that we've been wanting to do for years is clean out our garage. It's been one of those places that has now become full from floor to ceiling, wall to wall, with stuff. Things that are just tossed in there randomly as we go through and clean the house or, or pick up something new. And we've wanted for years to reclaim that space as something that can be used again to go through everything that's in there and make space maybe for kids to play or for work to get done or whatever it could be. Well, since we haven't had soccer practices, we've had a few hours here and there to go in and use the room. Because we're not traveling like we normally do, we've had a few days to go in and clean stuff out. And so we're at the place now where it is almost completely reclaimed. All of the tools are in one section. Sports equipment's in another section. We've made some money selling stuff we haven't used anymore. And we've taken the time and the space that this moment has created to do something with part of our life that we didn't like. Now that's a silly example, but the same thing is true for you and I on all kinds of big levels. What does this moment, this space you have right now make possible in your life? Are there things in your life, in your marriage or with your children, maybe it's part of your career that you're like, I really wish that I could change this right now. Maybe there's part of your life that feels kind of counterfeit, like it's not as real as it should be. And there's things going on internally inside of you right in here or right up here. Now is a moment that you have been given that you could do something about it and really discover what real life is and what it's all about. That's what we've been talking about uh, last week and, and heading into the next couple weeks is what is this real life anyway and how do I grow it? How do I make it uh, part of who I am? Last week we said, if you didn't know, the mission of our church here, the West Point Church of the Nazarene, is to connect people to real life in Christ. We're not interested in playing games. We don't want something counterfeit. We don't something, want something that won't stand up to crisis in the middle of your life or in the middle of my life. We want something that's real. And this real life, we define in a little bit because it's not all that real life is, but part of what real life is, is being transformed so that you can be propelled forward. That where you are isn't where you have to stay that the place you feel stuck isn't the place where you're going to remain. That there is something more waiting for you. And that something more comes through Christ. So how do you find life? How do you experience this real life? Well, the, the answer is trite sounding, but it's true. In order to have real life, you have to find life. And for us, that means you have to find Jesus. Jesus said that he is the life. That's part of who he is, is the life giver. And so you have to find the presence of God if you want to find what real life looks like and experience it for yourself. And that shouldn't be too hard, right? If you want to find right life, find the presence of God. And God has said if he is who he says he is, that he is all around us, that he's going out in front of us, that he's singing over us, that he'll go beside us and beneath us. And if you've accepted him into your life, then he will even live within you and be closer than a brother. So why is it, if you're like me, that I do not consciously know that he's with me all the time? Like it might be a faith thing, but I don't experience the presence of God in my life constantly. I don't experience him all the time. Why is it that I miss finding life for myself? I think there's probably two reasons that we, we miss God so much. I think the first reason is we just don't recognize Jesus because we're distracted. My favorite game to watch when we stop and eat lunch together as a family and just take a moment to relax is Brain Games. It's a show you can go and find it. It, it teaches us how our brains work by doing silly experiments and, and contests and one of the things they did recently reminded me of something I learned a long time ago about how we are so easily distracted that we miss right, what's right in front of our faces. So in this experiment, you are shown a basketball team passing a ball back and forth, and you are supposed to 
keep track of how many times they pass it, or in other variations, you know, how many times does the blue team hold the ball, or how many times does the ball bounce on the floor, whatever it is, you're focused on that. And so you watch about 30 seconds of this, and then they say, okay, stop, tell me how many times did that what we asked you to see happen. And you give them the number, and you, you feel good when you got it right. And then they ask a follow-up question that for a large, large majority of people makes us feel really dumb. They say, okay, well, did you see the gorilla? You're like, what gorilla? You told me to follow a basketball team as they passed a ball around the room. Well, what happens while you're paying attention to that ball being thrown around is a man in a gorilla suit saunters off to the middle of the stage, and he stands there, and he looks around, and he beats his chest like King Kong, and then he walks back off the rest of the stage. And for most of us, we are so focused on what is happening with the ball that we never notice the gorilla that is literally right in front of our face. I think too many of us, we're so busy focusing on what needs to get done or the things that we're worried about or taking care of our kids or hoping that our parents are safe or cleaning that house or making sure the bills are paid or whatever it is that's taking all of our attention. We're so focused on those things that Jesus could literally be standing right in front of us and we miss him because we're not focused, we're distracted. I think the other reason we don't recognize Jesus, we don't find life, is because we don't really know him. We, we haven't been intimately connected to him enough. We haven't spent enough time with him. We haven't shared enough life with him that we don't notice him when he's really there. When I was getting ready to get married, my wife and I, my soon-to-be wife at the time, we went off to go to a concert. And while we were there, she went off to talk to some other people, and I was kind of out by myself, and this guy comes running up, super excited to see me, super happy, man just patted me on the back, so excited to see me, asked how I was doing, asked about some friends of mine that, that I knew and how they were doing back, back home, and all of a sudden he's like, man, it was so great to see you, and then he turned around to leave, and I'm like, yeah, have a, have a great time, he's like, he's like, I'll try and stay in touch, Nick, and he went off, and my wife comes up after that, she goes, so who was that guy? And I could honestly answer, I had no clue who this guy was. And the truth was, he didn't know who I was either. He thought I was my younger brother, not myself. And for whatever reason, because of time or distance or whatever, he didn't know who I was because he hadn't been spending enough time with me to be intimately connected with like what I looked like and what I sounded like and where I was in life. And I didn't know him intimately enough because I'd never seen him before. When we don't spend time with God, we miss Him. Whether it's because we haven't spent enough time ever and we don't know who He is to look for Him when He's out there in front of us, or because we've spent a little bit of time and we think we know what He looks like and we think he, we know what He sounds like, but then we end up following after and connecting with these imposters that are out there that claim to be Him but aren't. In either case, we miss finding real life because we haven't found the presence of God. But there is something you can do that will help you find life. You can worship. Now, worship focuses us so that we can know Jesus intimately. Worship focuses us so we can know Jesus intimately. He, he inhabits the praises of his people, he says. He, where two or three are gathered in his name, he's there in the midst. And so if we want to find the presence of God... We worship. And Christ is always initiating a connection with us through his grace. He is always reaching out, always trying to connect, always giving us grace. And so worship, if you want a good definition of worship that you might not find in a book somewhere, it's definitely not in Wikipedia, but a great definition of worship is responding to the grace of God in the right ways. Responding to the grace of God in the right ways. Ways, Because when we respond to God's grace that he's always giving us, then it transforms us and it makes me aware of his presence and how close he really is. This makes worship a lifestyle, not a 45-minute service or 20 minutes of singing or listening to Hillsong when you get home. This is a way of living to know that God is sending you grace and then responding to that grace as best you can over and over again. Uh, Romans chapter 12, Paul's writing, and he's trying to explain this to the people that are going to hear this about what it means to really worship. 
And he put it this way. He says, therefore, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Well, Eugene Peterson wanted to make that connect with us a little bit deeper because this idea of worship as a lifestyle is not something that you get all of the time. It's not the way we use the word. And so he rewrote these verses this way. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, and you'll be changed from the inside out. Parenting is a great example of this. Like, my kids are a gift from God. My ability to provide for them and to parent them is a gift from God. It's a grace that he's given me. So how do I respond to that grace with my kids? Well, I parent them for God. My parenting is an act of worship. And when I think about it that way, man, that changes things. Like, how I discipline my kids, how I see them, what I want them to get involved in, what, that, what I'm okay with them doing. It becomes an act of worship. Not only am I doing it for them, but I'm doing it for God on behalf of God. It's an act of worship. Jesus himself modeled two ways that we can do this, that we now allow our minds to be changed, that we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, how we take our everyday, ordinary life and place it before God. Mark chapter 1 uh, starting at verse 21 to the end of the chapter, actually tells the story of about a 36-hour period in Jesus' life. And in this 36-hour period, it has a couple of patterns that you'll see repeated over and over, not only in the book of Mark, but also through all of the Gospels. And this is how Jesus did life in order to stay connected to his heavenly Father. So starting in verse 21, it says this. It says, They went to Capernaum where the Sabbath, when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. And news spread about him quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Now Jesus goes to the synagogue to worship together with others. He goes there to read scripture, to hear a teaching on what's happening, to focus himself on God Together, they are shaped by what they hear. Together, especially in this instance, they come to experience the presence and the authority of God to literally change people's lives and their existence. They come to see what it looks like when God's presence is powerfully active. That's the same thing that Jesus invites us to do. He invites us to come and worship together. Now, I hope that this pandemic and the season that we've been has, has really drilled home for you that worshiping together is more than just showing up at a certain place at a certain time together for like a limited space and calling it worship. That's part of it, but that's not all of it, man. Church is wherever you are to worship God. It can be at home with your family, doing this through a YouTube or a Facebook Live. It can be gathered together with people at work, at lunch. It can be in your car as you worship going down the road. Do not limit where you worship together. But make sure that where two or three are gathered in His name, you realize that the presence of Christ is there. 
When we get together like this, we do it to eliminate distractions. Like I come in and the other stuff in my life, my worries and my regrets, the things I've neglected, the things that are waiting for me, the bills I have to pay, the arguments I'm in, the drama at the office, all of that stuff is put to the side so I can focus in on Christ through a call to worship, through reading of scripture, through a song that's heard or sung, through this word that I'm sharing right now, hopefully Christ is being drawn into your attention. So you don't have to worry about the other things that show up. And when you focus on him now, you can see him better later. And so we respond to the grace that God gives us in this space with awareness. Awareness of his presence, awareness of his authority, awareness that he really is who he says he is, the Lord of all, the one who is worth chasing after, the one who has always been chasing after me. And so that's what Jesus did in the synagogue that morning. And then after he left, he went to one of his friend's family's home, and a mother-in-law was sick, so he healed her, and then people just kept coming for the rest of the day, past sunset. They just kept coming to be healed. The broken pieces of humanity, hurt lives, demon-possessed people, addicts, uh, suffering in all kinds of different ways. They just came, one after the other, crowded again around Jesus to be healed. And so late in the night, even into the next morning, in verse 35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. And Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Not only did Jesus worship with others together, he also worshiped alone. He needed to spend time alone with his father. And when he was there, he, he got direction like, okay, we're not going back to Capernaum. It's time to move on to the other cities. But I also believe, not only from here, but from other times when Jesus went to be by himself with the father, that he was refilled. Can you imagine what it took out of him to stop and deal with everyone who had come to see him that day, to heal them, to listen to their stories, to experience their pain and their grief and their suffering, and then to change that for them? I don't know about you, but I would be exhausted. And so spending time alone in worship with God, responding to the grace that God gave him, refilled him. In some ways, more than sleep ever could. And this became a pattern for his life. That over and over again, he would go and he would cry out to God when he was broken. And he would ask God to change plans. And he would spend time being ministered to by the Father by worshiping him alone. And so that is the invitation that he gives us too. To worship God by ourselves. To be alone before him so we can be completely transparent and honest. Look... That's how you become intimate with people, right? You let them see parts of you that you hide from everybody else. You spend time with them to be able to get to a place of trust to do that. When was the last time you did that with God? You don't have to hide anything from Him. He already knows it and He still loves you, but He needs you to respond to the grace that He offers with honesty. He needs you to really be yourself before him. We do this through spiritual disciplines, mostly. Things like getting away to pray, or reading scripture, or spending time in confession, or silence, or solitude. Like my typical pattern, this is just one, is that I have a, a journal and I have a guidebook, and I go to the guidebook and it tells me which scriptures to read each day, and it has a little excerpt from a, a classic Christian thinker, and I read that, and then I journal what my thoughts are. I journal my prayers, my, my, my feelings, my, my struggles, my temptations, and what I'm thankful for. I put it all in there because I want to get it out, and it's one of the ways that God talks back to me, and then I sit in silence alone to hear if there's anything else that he wants to say, and that is where I create intimacy with God. I can tell. I huge difference in my demeanor and how my day goes if that gets missed. 
as I find life in that moment. Yours doesn't have to look like that. It could be a time on a Bible app. It could be reading through a devotional book. It could be going for a walk and praying as you go. And that's your time with God. Uh, Susanna Wesley, John Wesley's mother a couple centuries ago, in a house without technology, with lots of kids running around her, would literally take the apron in her lap and put it up over her head. And her children knew to leave her alone because that was her time with God. What are you doing to connect with God. Find one that fits you. It doesn't have to look like anybody else's, but do things on purpose to connect with God. And it's no coincidence, as you continue to read the life of Jesus, that right before or right after all of the really huge, significant events in his life, you'll find this time of worshiping alone. I don't think it's a coincidence for Jesus, and I don't think it's a coincidence for us. And so when we find ourselves, either right before or right after, all of the big moments in life, time worshiping God, responding to the grace He gives us, man, that makes all the difference in the world. So how are you finding life? As a church, we can give you tools, we can create opportunities, but you have to own it yourself. No one can make you recognize Jesus. No one can force you to worship. Only you can do that. Only you can pursue the one that has been pursuing you before you were even born. I want to challenge you to do something about that. To not just think about it. To not just say, let's try it. But to actually train to be able to do it. Whether that's through... Doing a plan, like I've talked about or not, is not the important thing. I would ask you to do two things. Number one, calendar and commit to worship with others. Whether you're doing it at your home or coming in to the building when we're open on Sunday mornings or however it looks for you, commit. Put it in your calendar. Set aside the time like you would going on a date. And don't let other things interfere with that, but commit to it. And then make a plan to spend time worshiping God alone. Carve it out on the calendar. Find something that works for you. Start with maybe going for a walk. Start with picking up a devotional book. If you need help, message us. We'd love to give you some more resources for that. But find something to start. And then change it as you learn what works for you. But do it and commit to it. Don't just say, well, I'll try it and see how it feels like. Even on the days when it doesn't feel like it's working. Keep doing it because God is with you and his presence is what changes everything in your life. That's what real life exists in. It is being in the presence of God. And so if you want more of that, whether you're at work or at home or worshiping uh, in a service or whatever it looks like, if you want more of the presence of God in your life, then you have to be willing to find life where he says you can find it. Would you commit to doing that today? And would you pray? Lord, thank you for the ways that you've shown us how to find you. That you didn't make it a mystery, but you have, have given us examples, and you've given us plans, and you've shown us that it's more than just setting aside a, a little bit of time to sing some songs or listen to a sermon, but it is making a lifestyle choice to respond to the grace that you give us. Lord, I pray that as we go forward this week, we would not miss out on where you are in our lives, but we would see where you're present and we would respond to the grace that you've given us rightly. Lord, I pray that you would help us to commit to find you the ways that you've modeled by worshiping together, by worshiping alone, by spending time with you so we're not distracted by the things that are going on around us, and we know you well enough to recognize you when you show up. Lord, I'm grateful that you are the one who always is coming after us first and always initiating this connection. So I pray that for myself and for those that would hear my voice, we would respond to the invitation to come and be closer to you with a yes each and every time. And that we would find in you, when we find life, we find life that can withstand 
any crisis, any situation, any enemy, any disaster. Because when you have life in you, that is real life. Because it is life itself. We pray this in your name. Amen.